really happy to have uh, Scott Page here today uh, from uh, uh, Michigan and other other places, uh, Santa Fe and uh, other alliances that are given in his uh, in his bio. Uh, he is someone who's uh, you know well known for bringing modeling to social science questions. Uh, particularly in um, the past few years, he's been working on issues of the wisdom of crowds, on uh, on collectives making decisions, and on the, uh, the the diversity bonus, which was the name of his popular book, which came out a number of years ago. Uh, today, uh, he's going to give a paper uh, dealing with uh, his work on uh, on these questions uh, and uh, walk through some examples, uh, particularly uh, coming to a uh, applications to. Um, human resources and uh, choosing people to work, people analytics, as we call it at the at the business school. Um, we'll have about uh, forty minutes for this, something like uh, around that, and then we'll open up to uh, to uh, to question. Meantime, there's a button in front of you called Q and A. So if you do have questions, uh, please do pose them along uh, along the path. Um, I spoke quickly because I think Scott's a really interesting speaker, and I'm really anxious to hear him. So I'll just turn it over to him uh, to uh, to continue. Thanks, uh, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Bruce. And it's great. Uh, it's great to be here. It's, I have to admit uh, some regret in that it's you know I love New York and it would be fantastic to be in New York and enjoy the city even for a short time. But uh, at least I'm there virtually. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about a project that is in some sense sort of meta computational social science, in the sense that. There's a bunch of results by you know, some famous people, Kleinberg, Watts, um, Milan Tambe, in this space about using algorithms and using people to sort of solve problems. Actually, Tom Malone at MIT and Anita Woolley at Carnegie Mellon as well, looking at do the best teams consist of the best people? And so the work I want to talk about today, which I will um, you know, go, uh, let me do view slideshow here. Um, what I want to talk about today is, is an axiomatic analysis, trying to figure out like, when does a test exist? So what do we mean by that? So suppose I've got a group of people working on a problem, or are going to work on a problem, we're going to work in a team, going to work in a firm, going to work in a research lab. And I want to ask, could I have a test that I apply to individuals such that the individuals who score highest on that test form the best team? Now. This is just sort of an opening quote for this, is that if you are successful, this is a strange paper to give in a lot of settings because people who are successful, people who have jobs at Columbia, people who have jobs at Michigan, people who have jobs at NYU, typically we've done really well on these tests. And so we tend to think, oh, other people who do well on these tests are probably also smart. And so the best people are people who do best on these tests. So what I wanna do is I wanna start out by sort of pointing out, to use Whitman's phrase, um, a contradiction, right? So that we're large enough to contain a contradiction. And we're talking about sort of a societal level contradiction where on the one hand, we're saying everything should be done by teams. And the other hand, we're using lots of tests. Then I wanna quickly go through 10 examples. And that's because these examples are more computational in flavor. They're sort of like more fitting with this audience. Then I'll very quickly give the two theoretical results, the hiring principle and um, the re re replace the lowest ranked um, criterion. And then we'll talk about sort of generally what when wouldn't we expect a test to exist? And we'll show that if there's complementarities, if somebody fills structural holes, if there's benefits to diversity, that's gonna be situations where we probably don't have a test. Okay, so let me start out with this large enough to contain contradiction. Most work is now done in teams. If you look at patents in 1976, most had one author. If you look in 2018, um, almost half, you know, 47% almost half have three, three authors. And I'll, I'll share these slides um, after the talk. Um, if you look at academic research papers in 1960, most had one or two authors. If you look in 2016, most had five authors. Why? Well, if you sort of, again, look at the research, and this is worked by Brian Uzi and other people, um, what you find is that co-authored papers, co-authored patents, and actually the patent work is by Lada Adamic at Facebook, are just far more likely to be successful. So teams outperform individuals. Now, here's the contradiction at the same time. 80% of firms now use pre-employment testing, right? And what you find is this, this kind of works, right? But yet at the same time, you're seeing that we're moving away from the SAT score. Partly that was because of COVID and partly because there's sort of societal pressure that the, the test may have you know, racial bias or social class bias. So even though we're moving away from the SAT, Goldman Sachs cut 60% of its applicants based on an aptitude test. 
So it's almost like this IQ test, you have to pass just to make us the first bar at Goldman Sachs. Same is true at Google. Um, my son just went through, he's an undergraduate interning for some internships and they'll be like, tell us about your favorite experience and he'll give an answer. And then they'll say two thirds of three fifths of one fourth of a number is 24. What's 30% of that number? You know, and, you're, and then they're timing you to see how quickly you give a response. So it's not only can you get the right answer, it's how fast can you get it? Now, if you look across the, you know, sort of all of corporate America, what you find is because people get more and more applicants, these firms do, the percentage that use AI is increasing and increasing every year. So within a couple of years, 93% of firms are gonna use AI to decide who they hire, or at least, you know, sort of who makes it past certain cuts. Now there's a distinction here. If I give you an IQ test or one of these Goldman Sachs sort of cognitive tests, that's kind of like an individual test of ability. If I think of using AI on someone's transcripts and you know, written statements and things like that, that's like an individual test assigned to your record. But the point is in each case, what you're doing is you're assigning some sort of hiring criteria, whether it's a written test or looking at your record to individuals. And the question is, does that give you right, an optimal team? So for what sort of task could there be a test that you apply to individuals such that the highest scoring individuals comprise the optimal team? Here's the question. Now, in academics, I've got to make that formal. So the way I'm going to make that formal is to say, given a finite population, let's call that pop, let's assume that individuals have a type, which is in some set C, and there's a team performance function that says given K different types of people or K people, there's just a value assigned to that team of size K that depends on their types. And then the question is, could I assign a rule? Is there some sort of scoring rule I can assign to individuals R such that the highest performing team from that population pop consists of the individuals who score highest according to that hiring criteria? So this is just a way to make formal this simple motivational question. You say there's a population, there's a set of types, there's a performance function, does there exist a hiring criteria? Okay. Now there's some background literature on this. So a long time ago, Lu Hong and I wrote a paper showing that if you have a randomly talented team, they're gonna outperform the team of the best. So that would say um, that there's not gonna be a test. There's a paper by John Kleinberg and Mike Ragu that says there's no test that exists for supermodular functions. And I'll talk about all these papers in the talk. There's a paper by um, Marco, um, Leandro Marcolino, Tian Zhang and Milan Tambe. Milan just recently moved from USC to Harvard where they show a random team beats the best team at Go. So all of those are cases where there wouldn't be a test. But then there's some work by recent paper by Jensen saying if there's incentives for effort using a paper by model by Bonabu, Benabu, you get that the best team does actually equal the best. So this, the things kind of go in both directions. So what we want to do is sort of move away from just a collection of examples to sort of a deep understanding of um, the conditions when this will be true and not true. So why am I asking this question, right? So I wrote a book recently, as Bruce mentioned, called The Model Thinker. Here's the new maize and blue covered paperback. I was very happy basic books went all pro Michigan on me, which I'm very proud of. Um, and I give all these reasons why you might want to model. This particular paper is interesting because like the one thing you probably, this paper doesn't really talk about is using models to predict. You're not going to predict anything, but it does help us reason, explain, design hiring, communicate, take actions, and just kind of explore the world. So this this is really kind of a, a fertile question to think about. And it's been really fun to think about. So Lou and I have had just a fantastic time sort of exploring this. Now, when you do this, what we're, I wanna just step back and talk about what we're doing. We're trying to write down an axiomatic rule. That's a very sort of like, you know, just um, abstract problem. Can we write down a set of axioms such that we can say when a test exists and when it doesn't exist? Now it could be you just get an obvious answer and it wasn't worth doing. It could be you can't solve this thing. And it could be you get kind of a nuanced, you know, conditional answer. And that could be communicable, practical, and intuitive, or it could be obscure, opaque, deep in the mathematical weeds, using words like supermodular and not of much use. So we're going to see this one kind of a little bit of both, right? So we're going to get a nuanced conditional answer, and it's going to be communicable, communicable and intuitive, but a little bit opaque, okay? So would it have been worth it? Was this whole exercise worth it? Yes, because what we get, and here's, I'm going to sort of give away the main result, if there is a test, the test is not individual ability. The test would be homogeneous team ranking, which means this, if I had a team of a whole bunch of, if you want to decide, should I hire Bruce first or Scott first or Alexis first? The question you have to ask is, how would a team of all Bruce's do compared to a team of all Scott's compared to a team of all Alexis's? So if a test exists, that's the test. 
Now, the second thing is what are necessary and sufficient conditions for that test? It turns out there's something called the replace the lowest ranked condition. So if I use that test, the homogeneous team test, and it were always the case that if I pulled the lowest ranked person off and replaced them with some higher ranked, the team would do better, then I have a test, okay? So it's kind of interesting. So what I wanna do now in the bulk of the talk, I wanna give a bunch of examples. And that's because the real fun in this um, whole exercise has been the examples because we looked across the literature you know, from psychology to economics, to computer science, to data science, there's tons and tons of people who've written models, individual models in this space. What we're trying to do is prove a general theorem that shows all of these to be in some sense, interesting special cases. So here's the simplest case. Total team performance is just the sum of individual abilities. So this is people chopping down trees. If you're having people individually chop down trees, the sum of the value, the you know, number of they can chop down in total is just the sum of their individual values. I've got a green box around this because the answer is, is there a test? Absolutely. You just hire the people, hire the big dude, hire the person that can chop down the most trees. What if it's a coordinated sum? So what if it's the ability of person one plus the ability of person two plus the ability of person three minus a penalty for the variance? So what would this be? So here's the US women's crew team. They can each on a 2K row it in about six minutes, 45 seconds, which is, which is pretty darn fast. Try it to gym today. Um, just to give you an idea how fast this is, this is Cam Newton, who's the New England Patriots quarterback. He did a 2K in seven minutes, and you can see it was a relatively painful experience. So he wouldn't have made the team on ability, right? Because they do 645. But here's the interesting thing. There's no test for this. Even if Cam got down to six minutes, so suppose he worked on this and got down to six minutes, at least 45 seconds faster than them, because he would increase the variance so much, you wouldn't want to hire him. You'd rather have a whole bunch of people who are all rolling 645 then replace one of them who's running six, six flat because the boat would kind of go at an angle. All right, example three. Now slow down a tiny bit here. What if the people bring tools or perspectives or knowledge? And so now a type isn't like how many tr trees I can chop down, but it's just a set. So like I know network theory, I know psychology, I know negotiations. And you're sort of saying, okay, the value now of a team is just the size of the set of tools that people have. Is there a test for this, right? Um, and so this could also be unions of knowledge, right? So Max I might know networks, law and innovation. My wife, Jenna might know federalism, law and water, right? Um, this same example applies to something called the alternative use, um, uses test from psychology. This is sometimes called the brick test, right? Where you give someone a brick and you say, how many uses can you have? So I did something with the Expedia group where I said, suppose that you found 10,000 boxes of plastic straws in a storage room at a hotel. Now we all know plastic straws are like the devil's handmaiden now, right? They're an environmental disaster. So what, do, what could you do with these things? So I gave them four minutes to think of as many things as they could think of. Here's the distribution of ideas. Person A thought of 31, person B thought of 20 and so on. So if you, if you scored these people in terms of individual creativity, you'd say A is the most creative, J is the least creative, but the creativity of the, of the group of all these people is the union of their ideas. And so you can compute the Shapley value of these people in terms of how many ideas did they have. And you see that like person G actually sort of added more to the group than person F. And so what you see, even though person F had the same number of ideas and you see person J who had very few ideas actually had the same value to the group as person I. So what you get in this case is that there is no, that, that there isn't a test that consists of, like I said, how many ideas can you think of? That's not gonna be a test because what you really care about is how many unique ideas do you have? So let's spin this a tiny bit. And this is kind of an interesting, a super interesting example. Suppose it's the case for the alternative uses test like the straws test, and this was kind of true, certainly true of the brick test, that there's a set of common uses and that's a fairly small finite set. Like I can use a brick to build a wall, I can use a brick to bake a window, I can use a brick as an anchor for a boat, those sort of things. And then suppose there's a set of completely novel uses that's huge. That's just, you know, so for example, one of the most famous um, uses of the brick in the brick test is to use it as a coffin in your Barbie set, right? So you've got a set of Barbies and you use the, use the brick as a coffin. No one else is gonna think of that. If this is how the world works, there's common uses and then novel uses, individual performance is still not gonna be a hiring criteria. It's not gonna work, however, if it's the case that each person has some minimum number of common uses, like everybody thinks of like five or six random common uses, then for large groups, the number of novel uses 
will be a test. So creativity isn't a good test, but novel uses actually will be a test. And so what you see here suddenly is that, and this is what makes this space so interesting, and this is why there's so many papers in this area, is that like somebody can come up with a really interesting test, right? It's almost like coming up with a Lyapunov function or something that suddenly says, ah, here's a test. And if we use this criteria, we'll get the best team. But that criteria is different from individual ability. So bracket this for a second. A test need not be individual performance, right? So I think with the test where there's cases where there's no test, there's cases where there's test, only in a small percentage of cases will individual performance be the correct test. Typically, it'll be something else when you look across the literature. Here's another example. IQ test. Suppose there's, you know, you've got a set of questions. Your IQ is the number of questions you get correct. Those are often weighted. So here's Raven's progressive matrix test, right? This is, you know, got one of the highest sort of loadings in terms of IQs. One of the things that's interesting here is if you give people an IQ test and then you say it is the best team consists of people who score highest on an IQ test. So let me say that again. I have a bunch of people take IQ tests. And then I put them in teams and have them take an IQ test. Does the best team for an IQ test consist of the people with the highest IQs? And the answer is no. The reason why is because look at this graph on the left. You've got individual IQ scores on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis, you've got contextual IQ. Contextual IQ is, do I get questions right that other people get wrong? So you can have two people who have an IQ of say 125, some of whom are getting kind of all the easy questions right and all the hard questions wrong. Other people are getting the really hard questions right, but overthinking some of the easy questions. You'd rather have that second group of people, right? You'd rather have the people who are getting the really hard questions right. So if you have an IQ test and PI is the probability of getting question I correct, and suppose it's the case that earlier questions are harder. So you can rank the questions. Question one is the hardest, question two is the next hardest, and so on. If probabilities of being correct are independent, right, then it could actually be if you've got a large group, there is a hiring criteria, which is how well do you do on the hardest question? That'll end up being a hiring criteria. So not your IQ, but how well you do on the hardest question. Okay. Next example. We kind of go into. What about if I have a group that has to communicate? So now individuals are sets and the value of the group is gonna be the union of ideas they have, right? So how much stuff they can think of times the intersection because you've got to kind of like, you know, be able to communicate what you know with someone else. So if I had person one knows ADEFG, person two knows ADEF, person three knows ABC, person four knows AB. If I have the value of S1 and S2, their union is ADEFG, their intersection is ADEF, so their value is gonna be 20. It turns out in this case, the ordering S1, S2, S3, S4 is a hiring criteria. So individual ability would be how many ideas you've got. That actually is a hiring criteria. But I wanna look at this example a little bit more deeply. You could say that a hiring criteria imposes monotonicity if replacing someone with someone ranked higher always improves the group. Now in this case, that's not true because so even though there's a hiring criteria, you should hire type ones before type twos, before type threes, before type fours. Look what happens for S3 and S4. They have a union of ABC and an intersection of AB. So when I look at that team together, their value is six. But if I look at S2 and S4, they have a union of ABDEF, but their intersection is only A, so their value is five. So what's interesting here is the group S3, S4, which is lower as lower ability people actually performs better than S2, S4. So even though there's a hiring criteria in here, it doesn't satisfy monotonicity. So this is again, one of these advantages why it makes sense to kind of write down very abstract models and try and understand necessary and sufficient conditions. Because what we see is that monotonicity is not necessary for there to be a hiring criteria. Okay, now I wanna shift a little bit and because I've totally ignored incentives here and say, what if, what if I had incentives? What if I take a standard sort of like Venabu, you know, joint production model where there's people have an ability, they have an effort, there's a cost of effort, and there's some probability of success, which is continuous increasing and concave in kind of their ability times their effort, right, raised to some power. You can solve for an equilibrium effort level here. And in this case, what you get is ability is a hiring criteria, even though in this case, which is interesting, is if I'm high effort, if let's say Bruce is high ability and I'm low ability, 
Bruce compensates for my low ability by working harder. So incentive effects actually make it so if you group a high ability person and a low ability person, the high ability person will work harder. That still doesn't overcome the fact that you'd rather hire someone of higher ability, right? So the fact that there's compensating behavior isn't enough to sort of overcome the fact that um, you'd just rather have someone of higher ability. And if you look at this function, even though it's raised to exponents and there's a continuous sort of transform, at the core, this is an additively separable function. So if we go back to my very first example about additivity, and I throw in incentives with some convexity that economists like to do, and then I throw in, make it a game and solve for the equilibrium, I'm still gonna get ability being a hiring criteria. Okay, now I wanna go to the data scientist. So great paper by Kleinberg and Ragu, where they say, what if we do this? What if I take a really statistical view and say a problem solver is a random variable, right? So it's a distribution of sort of ideas that have some sort of value. And the outcome could be the sum of those by the team, it could be the union, it could be the max, or it could be just some arbitrary function of the realizations of those random variables. So I'm a distribution, and when I come in the group, I have a realization. So here's what's sort of interesting. Sum, which we just saw in the Benabu case, but we saw in the earlier case, if it's just a sum of the random variables, yep, there's a test, which is expected value. If it's kind of the union of the random variables, there's not, right? Because we just sort of saw that. If it's the max, so if I take the max of them, it turns out expected value isn't a test, but an order statistic works approximately as a test. So you can get arbitrarily close in some cases using an order statistic. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a second as a test. But if F is super modular, if there's any sort of synergies between the types, then no test exists. There does not exist a test over individuals it gives you the optimal team. Let's move to uh, Milan Tambay's group. Leandro Marcolino got his uh, PhD working with Milan. Um, they said, okay, let's, let's do this same thing. Let's think about a test for people playing a game. So now I'm gonna construct an algorithm for playing Go and I'm gonna rank these algorithms kind of from best to worst. And then I'm gonna have groups of seven or five or nine algorithms play Go using plurality rules. So they're just gonna vote on what move you should take. The result is, a team of the best algorithm and even a team of neighbors of the best algorithms lose to a collection of good algorithms. And here's the logic. If I take a diverse team, suppose that there's um, the correct move is in green and all these, there's all these other incorrect moves. What often happens with the diverse team is you get like two or three people vote for the correct move and a whole bunch of people vote for the wrong move, but they wrote for different wrong moves. If you look at the best seven on a hard move, what might happen is only three of them get the right move, four of them get an incorrect move. So that's actually a higher percentage than in the previous case where only two got the correct move and five got incorrect moves, but they all have the same incorrect move because they're similar and you end up making the wrong plurality choice. So here's the interesting thing about thinking about sort of using algorithms as a test work for algorithms in a large choice space. If the best algorithms are similar, they make correlated mistakes and the correlated mistakes can outweigh the best alternative. If they're diverse, they make uncorrelated mistakes, but they make correlated correct moves. And the, the lack of correlation of the mistakes means that the best team, that the, that the vote will go to the correct answer, okay? And so here's, I put this in, I'm gonna give you the slide. So here's more formal logic on that. Just two more examples and then we'll get into the general theorem. So, Lou and I, in our 2004 paper, we say, look, an agent is a perspective, a representation of a problem, so like a rugged landscape, and then heuristics where they crawl along that landscape. And what, they, what we find is if you have a large set of problem solvers, if there's something we call the calculus condition, so if there's some countable set of local optimal problem solvers can get stuck, and a moderately large group, then the team of the best, and again, best here is individual performance, is gonna be outperformed by a diverse team, okay? Last one multiple problems. And this is some work by um, Jonathan Bender and I, Jonathan Stanford Business School, and then this, this current paper with Lou and I. Suppose a task involves T problems. So now I want to think about it. I'm not hiring people for one problem. I'm going to hire a set of people that are going to work together on T problems. It's kind of like the IQ test. Um, a type is a distribution of likelihoods of solving each problem. And team performance is just going to equal the number of problems solved, right? So 
Ability is not going to be a hiring criterion. To see why, suppose I hire, so this is probability of solving problem. Problem one on the horizontal axis, probability of solving problem two on the vertical axis. C1 is the person of highest ability. Now I want to ask how much does C2, how much does somebody else add to C1? What you can do is draw a line through C1 and then draw the perpendicular bisector. And that'll give you sort of like an ISO addition to the group curve. The, hor the 45 degree line is the ability curve because your ability would just be the sum of your probabilities. So what you'd see if you look at person C2, anybody below the dotted line is lower ability than C2. Any above, above, above the dotted line is higher ability than C2. Anybody to the right of the solid line adds more to C1 than C2. So what you see is anybody in the region B is lower ability, but a better addition to C1. Okay, so there's no hiring criteria. So those are all the examples. And like one of the, the reason we wrote this papers were like, oh my gosh, there's now 15, 20 papers <laughs> where people have like kind of looked at, does there exist a test? Some of these are really computational, some are mathematical, some involve incentives, some are, you know, very simple involving like, you know, the alternative uses test. What can you prove? Well, it turns out, here's what you can prove. This is, and it's not clear how we're gonna publish this paper because the main result is very simple. If a hiring criteria exists, it has to be equivalent to a ranking based on homogeneous teams. So this is it. So really simple thing. Your value, right, if you're type J, is just how would a team of only you do? So how would a team of Bruce's do? How would a team of Scott's do? If there's a test, that's the test, right? So let's go back to the thing we just did before. Before I was saying your ability line is that dotted line the homogeneous type test would be this curved line, like a circle, right? So it'd be like, how would a whole team of people exactly like me do? And what you see there, if I use that as a criteria, there's still a whole set of people in the region, the different region B, that would add more to group with C1 that would be worse as a team of themselves. So you can immediately see, you know, so rather than kind of like have to prove a separate theorem from all these things, you can have a really simple test. If this is a test, you can have a really simple rule. If everybody being a team of only those people would be better, then there's a test. And if not, there's not a test. Now we can use this to like help flesh out some like really relatively intense. I, I say this because I've refereed all these papers. So I can tell you these have been relatively intense um, academic disagreements. So Anita Woolley and Tom Malone have a whole bunch of papers showing average team IQ does not predict team performance. Bates and these other people have these papers, empirical papers showing high IQ teams perform best. Duncan Watts has these papers. If you take people who've done best on knapsack problems, they make the best teams. So some of these papers show um, best teams consist of the best people, some of them don't. Turns out you can actually take that graph I just showed you, these all involve solving problems and, and sort of like tell a just so story of why they're all true. The difference between the Woolley paper and the Bates paper has to do with heterogeneity of ability. Woolley and um, Malone are choosing in a lot of their work, MBA students. And so they're people who have relatively similar abilities. Bates in their papers are choosing people from Mechanical Turks who have a wide variety of abilities. So let's look at our first example. I've got C1, I'm thinking about adding C2. There's that region B where I could find somebody of lower ability than C2 that would add more to the group. But if I've got a massive variation in ability, and they're not just solving two problems, they're solving like 20 problems, then if C3 lies, if the next best person lies below this finely dotted line inside the red circle, right, so if they're in that lower corner of region A, then they can't add more than person C2. So if I'm drawing people with a lot of variation in ability, what's going to happen is individual ability will probably work as a test for problem solving. Let's go to the Watts paper. What the Watts paper seven people do is they're having them solve knapsack problems. And these are all really similar problems. So what you'd expect here is there's a lot of correlation and ability across problems. I'm good at one knapsack problem. I'm probably gonna be good at another knapsack problem, but there could be subtle differences. What that means is almost, instead of having people uniformly distributed or normally distributed across this sort of P1, P2 space, they're gonna be in a pretty narrow cone, right? The ability to solve problem one is gonna be pretty darn correlated to the ability to solve problem, solve problem two. Well, now if you do this, if you put people in this little cone, you see, yeah, there's still a region B, right? Rather bring someone to the group who's of lower ability than person C2. However, 
the size of that region B is tiny compared to the size of region A. So if I look at these three empirical papers, I suddenly see, you know, this, this sort of model gives us some understanding of why they could see what they see. If I'm drawing people of roughly similar ability, which by the way, would be true of most firms, then it's gonna be the case that um, there's no test. If there's a lot of variation in ability, then there's gonna be a test. Or if there's incredible correlation across the task you're gonna have people do, which is what's true of Watts and is not true of Malone and Woolley because they're doing a really diverse set of tests, then you'd expect there to be a test. Okay, so I gave you a hiring criteria sort of saying, if there's a test, it's a hiring criteria. Is there a necessary and sufficient condition for a hiring criteria? And it turns out there is, and it's really simple, which is replace the lowest rank. So what you can prove is this, a hiring criteria exists if and only if replacing the lowest ranked member with someone higher improves team performance. Now this is different than monotonicity, right? Monotonicity says that if I replace someone with someone higher ranked, I would do better. So what this means is any violations of monotonicity, right, involve replacing the non-lowest ranked person. So if I replace the lowest ranked, I've got to do better. So if you violate monotonicity, it has to involve replacing the non-lowest ranked. So remember this example we had where the group of three and four were better than the group of two and four. I'm not replacing the lowest ranked person. Replacing the lowest ranked person, I mean, I'm replacing person four. I'm replacing a higher ranked person, person three, with someone who's person two. And so this violates monotonicity, but it doesn't violate the non-lowest ranked, the lowest ranked condition. So it turns out <laughs> after setting this whole thing up and doing all this work, trying to figure it out, we get two really simple rules. Rule one is if there's a hiring criteria, it's how would a team of identical people do? And the necessary and efficient condition for there to be a hiring criteria is, can you replace the lowest ranked person? Now, the question is, are these intuitive, easy to use, or are these opaque and vague? I'll leave that to you. Let's talk quickly about synergies and then we'll kind of open things up for questions. So what if I said A and B are complementary? That would say if a team with two A's improves um, if one of the A's is changed to a B. So what if there's synergies? Um, you could also think about there being cohort complements. So what if there exists a cohort such that the team consisting of S and one A and one B outperforms a team consisting of S and two A's and S consisting of two B's. So not always synergistic, but just if there's a cohort where you'd want a combination of A's and B's as opposed to either one. Well, what you can show is that um, it cannot include complementary types, but it could include cohort complements as long as they don't include the lowest ranked member of the group. So you could have all these cohort complements that involve people near the top, but you can't have cohort complements that involve um, people at the bottom, which is kind of interesting. What about diversity? Well, there's, again, this is where you run into a lot of literature. So there's people saying, you know, diversity is optimal. The best team is diverse. You could also say what diversity improves, replacing a type with multiple copies um, improves performance, right? So if you took it, let me rephrase it. So I have a type that there's multiple versions of. If I replace one of those with someone else, I do better. Um, or you could say diversity dominant. Any homogeneous team is outperformed by a diverse team. These are different notions of sort of diversity adding value. So if the best team is diverse, if diversity improves, or if diversity is dominant, any one of those three conditions, there's no hiring criteria. You, sat, you, you, uh, you don't satisfy the lowest rank condition. Okay, let's go to Ron Burtz quickly. And I apologize, I'm a Ron is in white font down here. <laughs> what if type fills a structural hole? So type H would fill a structural hole between types A and B if a team with A, Bs and Hs outperforms a team with only As and Bs, um, but a team with Hs and not As and Bs is gonna perform poorly, right? So you need, you need the As and Bs there and the H sort of filling things out what you get is also a result here. If there's a structural hole, there is no test, okay? All right, so quick takeaways, and then we'll have you know, a good 20 minutes for questions. So the first one is, if there's a test, that test is not necessarily gonna be individual performance, right? Which is kind of surprising. So when you think, of, and, and let's think about why this is so important. And one reason I was really excited to give this talk to this group if we think about using artificial intelligence or hybrid groups of people in artificial intelligence to think about who we hire, you shouldn't be thinking about necessarily like how good is this person, right? right? What you should be thinking of, right, 
is how good would a team of people exactly like this person do if you think there really is a test, right? If you don't think there's a test, which would be probably most cases, you shouldn't be using a single criterion to hire people. You should be looking for different types of people. You should be saying, let's have this battery of tests to hire this type of worker, this battery of tests to hire this type of worker, this battery of tests to hire this type of worker. It's a, there's just a logical contradiction. This is the sort of Whitman quote that started this by saying, we want to hire the best people. And we've developed this really broad test to find the best people. The point is that if you really thought it were possible for the thing you're doing, that test should not be to find the best people, it would be to find the people who would be the best homogeneous team. I think that's very likely to be the case that this would even hold, and you should be using probably different types of tests. A way to think about it, and this is the, that one I think is way really intuitive, this one I think maybe falls in the opaque realm, if the replace the lowest rank holds, so if you had a test and you were applying it, whether it was AI, whether it was a written test, whatever that test was, do the thought experience. Would it always be the case that if I replace the worst person on that test with someone I scored higher, that my team would do better? If that's the case, then you're actually, your test works. Last thing is, um, if a hiring criteria exists, you could have some complementarities there, but it would have to be among kind of like the better types and they have to be rare, but you can't, if, if you're, if, if you're saying, which so many firms I visit, government agencies, <laughs> I've been doing a lot of stuff in the intelligence community. So on the one hand, you've got all these people saying, we're using state-of-the-art AI to find the best people. And then they're saying, we get these huge benefits from diversity. Those, those are contradictory statements, right? You have to, and so then the question is, how do we, and I'll just kind of tee this up, how do we think about, and I have answers to this, but it'd be fun to talk about with a group this smart, how do we think about using AI? How do we think about using people to hire people at firms, to admit students, you know, put people on our research teams? Because what all these sort of, you know, these dozens of individual papers show, and then our sort of axiomatic approach shows is that probably not the case if anything interesting happens, that there exists the test, right? Okay, thank you very, very much. And uh, we have quite a bit of time for questions. And I'll stop the share and I'll go back in real life mode here. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Scott. That was, uh, that was great. Uh, gave us a lot. Uh, I'm not sure if it is, if, I'm not sure how many people have that range of, of knowledge of all these different models uh, <laughs> from, uh, you know, landscapes, uh, structural holes to, uh, to super modularity. Um, so you, you may have some questions on what happened here over the past uh, 40 minutes uh, on this. So um, I hope it intersected with some people's, you know, that hopefully each person yeah. can get, like, Right. Like, uh, certain abuses test or because I didn't know the audience. I thought, okay, I'll do some psychology, some computer science, some econ, some great. No, it's all great. I, I, I will make one. Uh, um, there's so much to talk about with you. I, I left out one thing, by the way, in your book uh, on the um, on the model of thinker. Um, you had a great example of when problems arise, and you gave it in a super super tanker example, and. Uh, and you say, and that's why super tankers are the right size because they won't get stuck in the Suez Canal. So uh, <laughs> bad prediction on that one. Uh, so I've uh, taken some serious heat for that. Um, yeah. yeah, because I, you know, one of the things I talk about is in the papers that, you know, volume goes up, why models are so valuable is mo volume goes up cubed, right? But surface area only goes up squared. And so the cost of a ship is really surface area. And so that way ships got as big is they can, um, you make ships as big as you can possibly make them so that you, um, for economic reasons. And I said, so why aren't they infinitely big? And I said, they make them as big as they possibly can so they fit through the Suez Canal. So this was a picture that I drew this week. It's like, somebody said, what are you working on? I said, I'm working on this problem for my book, right? This is the boat stuff. Right. Because you know, I've taken a lot of heat for that comment. That they make them just wide enough. Right, <laughs> well, you know, I'm not giving you heat. I'm just making it up <laughs> on this. So uh, there's a lot to ask you, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be talking about this. So why don't we just take one or two of the models you discussed, okay? Uh, yeah. So uh, I'd like, to get, like you to go back a little bit maybe about the super modularity, explain a little bit to us, yeah. you know, which in my mind has to do with, you start off with this, you know, all, you know, all Scots, and then you replace, uh, let's say there's three Scots in the team, and you replace one, and you got, you know, Scott, Scott, you know, Charlie, you know, you can get, 
you know, uh, Scott, uh, Charlie, Betty, or, or, or for that matter, you can get Scott, you know, Charlie, Charlie, and that kind of stuff. So you get a, a permutation, you get the power set of all these combinations, yeah. and you expect them to be rising in some uh, monotonic way. Uh, well, I want you to care from that. You expect them to be rising overall in this um, slat lattice, which we're, which we're uh, observing. Um, so tell us how that works, you know, more for you. And then it, it sounded to me like you were rejecting that as a test. And you were saying was, uh, we should move to other other things as well uh, instead, uh, particularly getting rid of the lowest uh, lowest performing uh, uh, elements. Yeah. So at first I want to say, so the Kleinberg paper, the Kleinberg Ragu paper is a spectacular paper, and we all we we sort of feel they come up with this approximate test for expose the value of the group is like the best answer anybody has, and what they show is like expected value doesn't work. What you want to do is use this order statistic, and you know, which is kind of like weight in the tail, and adjust that to group size. What well, turns out. I mean, they do a lot of really complicated math and statistics. It turns out like we do really simple things by running something axiomatic and except their test is an approximation of how would it, how would a group of all the same people do, <laughs> right? right? But then then when they say, what if it's super modular in the sense like what if, and I think of this as, the way I explain this to sort of non-technical audiences, I said, you know, imagine that like you, each of us brings in like a bucket of ideas or pulls an idea out of a bucket. And then Stuart Kaufman and Stephen Johnson have this wonderful notion of the adjacent possible. Like you think of something, and then once you think of something, I'm like, oh, Bruce's idea just made me think of something else. Their notion of supermodularity in that paper is a formalization of the adjacent possible in the sense that like, there's a set of things brought out, whether it's a bucket of things or something drawn from a bucket, and then somehow those get recombined. You know, so supermodular just kind of means you're kind of doing more than the sum, right? Um, those get recombined into something new. If that happens, there's not going to be a test over individuals. But that doesn't mean, and this is where I think it really, I mean, getting at your point though, because I think you've raised, you've hinted it, I think it's really profound. When I'm thinking about adding someone to my research group, like let's take neuroscience. Here's an example of a friend of mine giving neuroscience. There's like 60,000 papers written in neuroscience. He hired someone from Princeton who was amazing. And her advisor the next year said, I've got someone this year who's also amazing. And he said, that's the last person I'm gonna hire. <laughs> and the reason why is, you know, there's 60,000 papers written. The set of things you can know in neuroscience is huge. The set of tools you have, your knowledge base, that sort of thing. The last person you'd wanna hire is someone exactly like the person you previously hired. And right. you can do this at a micro level. So I did with NASA, we looked at this just for fun. If you look at advanced fluid dynamics at MIT, Illinois, Michigan, and Berkeley, which you'd think is kind of like, a pretty standard course, the overlap in the syllabus is pretty low. Mm -hmm. And so that if you go to the toolbox model we had where you care about the union of tools, like what you teach at Columbia, right? In data science is probably different than what they teach at NYU, which is different than what they teach at Stanford. So you don't want to hire two Stanford people. That's the, uh, the Michigan, a Michigan person would be great to hire. Uh, uh, Absolutely, except, you know, never get us out of here. It's, it's you know, an Edenic place to live. That's right. the let me ask you for, for one more clarification, and then uh, we'll take some uh, some mm -hmm. questions which are building up here. Uh, yeah. Tell us tell us a bit more about this uh, about getting rid of the lowest ranked uh, people. Did I understand that correctly? Was was kind of a a rule which came out of here? Because uh, it does, you know, on a you know a humanities uh, evaluation, it looks uh, problematic. Right. Uh, but, may, but maybe you meant something else by the whole uh, the whole thing. So. so here's what's I mean. So again, this is what's kind of and. Lou and I have been laughing about this because so we you know so we got this result that said um, if there's a test so if a test does exist it's got to be you know, like how would a homogeneous group do but that's not a set of necessary and sufficient additions for such a test to exist and we developed two super complicated sets of conditions that were just almost beyond our own comprehension like if these five conditions hold and eventually we figured out oh my gosh they're all equivalent to this idea if you, you rank people by homogeneous test. If it's always the case that you move the lowest person off and could re replace them with someone higher, you did better, then there's a test. Now, one way to think about that is it's, it's so before this, you might've said, in order for there to be a test, it has to be additive. That's not true. we got a bunch of examples where it's not like that uncommon common thing, right? There's a test that's not even close to additive. Um, but what it, and you might think, oh, it has to satisfy monotonicity. That's not true either. It can violate monotonicity like crazy, but it can't violate monotonicity kind of at the bottom. So what that means is synergies that exist have to kind of like 
increase as you move up the, yeah. the ladder. Mm -hmm. So this does not mean, so we're not, I'm, I'm saying, I would think most of the time tests don't exist, right? But the criteria for tests existing is not separability. It's not monotonicity. It's assign people scores based on how a team of them, their own would do, and then ask, would I always be better replacing the worst? And so when I was talking to the, I was talking to the Fed about this work um, in New York, and they just hired a sociologist for the first time or something. And I was like, you know, I could hug you, fantastic. Like, you know, what's the margin of value of the 600th economist, you know? You have to really think economists are a lot better than sociologists. And, but the point is a team of all sociologists would probably not, you wouldn't want them setting money supply, right? So the economists are gonna be ranked above, but the replace the worst criteria is not gonna hold. Maybe we shouldn't use the word worst, right? What replace the lowest ranked is what we call it. You wouldn't wanna replace that one sociologist with another economist because the, the team would perform worse. So, so it violates the replace the lowest rank condition. There is no test. And like, I went way on a limb and said, you know, you might even hire a psychologist uh, or a data scientist. Data scientist, right. Be better. <laughs> so crazy yeah. out there, right? Yeah, uh, let me turn to these questions uh, on this because, you know, it's, it's easy to talk to you uh, selfishly on this because uh, uh, it's also interesting. But Robert Downs has a, has a question. Uh, he asks, uh, would there be value in testing for the ability to work with others? Um, and which is a great question because you know the papers by Deming, which shows that teams are, as you said, to start, teams are dominating more and more. So shouldn't we be really thinking about, you know, uh, social skills as a fact? So this is where, so one of the things that Woolley and this is the distinction between the Woolley paper and the, and the Bates paper, right? Which are cited in the, Alexis has the paper, if people want the paper, you can pull up the formal sites. But so what Woolley and Malone find, at first they found that the more women in a group, the better the group did. But then when they did further testing on, um, sort of facial, there's these tests, sort of facial affect tests that you can give, like, you know, can you recognize people's emotion? That that was really what was explaining it. And women are better at that than men. And that that was explaining the full gender effect. And so one dimension in terms of getting along well in a group is just kind of understanding how other people are reacting to what you're saying. And that's what's made, I think, Zoom really hard for people because we rely on body language a lot. That's one reason why groups haven't been as effective on Zoom because you can't read the crowd as well. So reading other people, you know, this is why, you know, you do, you get this argument that like, boy, management suddenly becomes incredibly important. Like running a group of, like, how do you run a group? Um, how do you work within groups? And so one of the things we're doing in a lot of, you know, most universities now we do much more group-based work because of the fact that people are gonna go work in teams. So there's a question of, is ability to work in groups something that you teach people? I think it is, but do people have sort of, natural abilities to be better at that. I think that's also true. The evidence shows that's also true and that some of us are better at reading or worse <laughs> reading people's faces. Some people are better. Some people may, just your affect may be warmer. Um, but the other thing is it's not clear that there's a best type, right? Because, you know, there's certainly work from Rand, a lot of work from Carnegie Mellon in this, you know, a long time ago, sort of the Mark Olson thing about having like red teams and the CIA has done this for a long time with like, you know, put someone in the role of the antagonist Carnegie Mellon in their tenure decisions still has an, somebody arguing the opposite side, right? So, and yet at Stanford, you've got, Bob, um, you've got to work on the no asshole rule. Like you don't want those people in the room. So awesome. you know, I think it's, it's, it's still out there, but clearly how you work within groups matters a lot. I'm doing it, you know, as, as Jeffrey Hill mentioned in his comment, right? Like if you think of people as vectors, you kind of want people or thought, like ability is kind of like the sum of things you've got, right? And Diversity is kind of like how orthogonal are you to your group? And I think that's, you know, again, one of the 10 models. I think it's a particularly powerful model, particularly to economists and data scientists who like, like to think in terms of orthogonality. But then there is this question of how do all those pieces work together, right? Yeah. Well, and also it's an educational implication too, because we could possibly teach people to, to do that work uh, on that. So, um, you know, which is a larger question, but law schools, they still do individual teaching. You know, it's, it's, it's driven that way. The ranking is really critical by individuals and, and so on. Uh, but more and more, you can imagine these things can be, uh, you're not born just a team member, but you can, you can be taught those, you can experience those uh, in a team and learn, uh, and learn from that. So it has a, a broad implication. Yeah, and one thing I'd add to this, right, which is like, if you look at the work by um, Brian Uzi and other people on like academic teams, one thing you find is that 
the very best teams are the worst. I always joke, homogeneous teams are like the land of B pluses. <laughs> right? The A teams are diverse, the C teams are diverse. That argues exactly for this point, right? That like, if you have a diverse team, you've got the potential to be better than if you're homogeneous for the logic, you know, for the reasons we just saw for most complex tasks like research. But if you can't manage that team, you're also more likely to have a train wreck. Yeah. Right? Sure, and you, uh, Gus Stewart. Gus Stewart is a, also kind of a, a polymath uh, colleague of ours. Uh, and I worked a lot on, uh, on on many things, and including how to make uh, firms uh, understand how to be better uh, from a point of view of uh, economics and Adam Brandenburger and, and that kind of that kind of work. He writes, "Can the replace the weakest result be interpreted as the criterion only exists?" if the weakest player is always the binding constraint? Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a great question. So one of the things we did not have in here, but we'll add a section. Um, if I thought about people sort of putting constraints on what we could do, so that would be true like in the rowing team. That's another way to think of that. Like we can only go as fast as that person. Um, then, you'd have, then you would have a test. So I could run an alternative rowing model where the speed is the min, right? Um, or there was some constraint in terms of how many things, like suppose like, you know, um, we're translating things across a bunch of languages quickly and there's the speed of someone's ability to translate. Yeah, if, if someone were constrained, if the lowest ranked person were the constraint, then it would be the case that um, you satisfy that condition. The challenge I have, and even though like we've written this, we've been working on this paper for two years, it's still puzzling because when I think about replacing the lowest ranked type, it's really hard not to think of it. The lowest ranked is like them on their own. The key is you got to think of lowest ranked as a group of them. So, and and that's where we're we've struggled a bit to try to think really creatively about this. What would be what are cases where rankings according to a group of us are different than rankings according to us, kind of like our individual ability? But but your logic's exactly right, and it's a great point. It's incredibly. I give ten models, and then you're like, what about this one? <laughs> you, know, you have a forecast on that one. Model eleven. Yeah. You have a forecast on that one. If you are constrained by the, by the, uh, uh, by the, the kind of shop prices on the least, the least uh, person. It's kind of weak. A weak link mod. Uh, yeah. Then there's probably a test. Yeah. 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 yeah that's a great point. Absolutely. Um, we talked earlier about this issue on uh, on uh, on a on uh, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, um, so, you know, an algorithm can be written to, let's say you, we, we write the Scott Page algorithm. Right. And we just throw a whole bunch of data on it. Um, and, but yet an AI, maybe an AI counts as what, a team of one? Uh, is that how, how that works? Or, uh, um, so what is your, what is your vision of, of, of human AI, you know, interaction? Uh, or uh, is it just, is it, is it, can you get something which is a compliment or the or the substitutes in your uh, in your world? So I think I mean this is where I think I mean this paper does raise and we don't talk about it a really fascinating question in terms of like you know now that we have hybrid teams of people and AI, um, the fact that the AI is better than people doesn't mean that you should get rid of people, right? Because if there's synergies between the people and the AI, then clearly you want to um, also rely on people. But, but where this is used, I mean the thing that in some of the questions like just kind of like reading the chat the Q and A on the side. Um, Professor Wang asked this question, um, you know, how is this stuff being used? And like, I got a so, you know, a lot of different firms and they'll say, like, we've, we've gone back and looked at all of our past employees and so seen what's made people successful, right? And now we're using AI to decide like, you know, who we should hire. And I think the wiser firms are saying, well, we're using AI to inform how we should hire. First of all, there's, there's issues of like bias in the algorithm, this whole, this whole crowd knows. But it's also the case that like individual performance Again, you're, you're falling victim to this thing that like, you know, the best team is going to consist of the best individual performers, even if you're, you know, backcasting in a performance based on kind of how people actually did once they were hired, right? Because that does sort of capture how they were doing in teams a little bit. And I think this is where individuals can say, yeah, you know, in looking at Alexis, she doesn't score as high in the algorithm, maybe as Bruce does, but like, she's bringing this particular set of tools. We're a tool-based firm. She's got tools nobody else has, right? So she's probably going to add more to the firm. And so does that, if, if you're using AI to sort of spit out a ranking, this paper would suggest you really want to be careful about that. But then, but it's interesting though, is that people then should adapt. 
And what people should say is I should be less concerned with thinking about ranking people in terms of like how well they would do on average in our firm, because the AI is probably nailing that. And I should be looking at these other questions, not only in terms of bias, but also like, you know, do they have orthogonal skill sets generally? Do they have a particular tool nobody has? Are they really good in working in groups, right? These other sort of dimensions that the AI can't capture. Thanks, Scott. So I just noticed in the Q&A, I was looking at the chat here, you've got a lot of things here. Yeah. <laughs> and I apologize. The research career has been laid out in this Q&A. Well, yeah. So a lot of them are asking you really is, you know, so what, what is the advice you're giving to a, to a company on this? So what is the implication uh, on this, uh, you know, regarding diversity or the, or the hiring practices you use. So what's the, what's the bottom line when you, uh, when you walk in and do you get applauded at the end for your, for your, uh, for your advice? <laughs> do I get applauded? So I think, you know, one piece of advice I'd have, like if, like if I'm talking to a place like a consulting company or the intelligence community or, you know, a financial firm or places like, you know, Netflix, Google, those sort of places. One thing I'd say is like, you know, you, you might want to think about, you know, having algorithms that predict different types of employees, right? So just ask, are there bins you could put people in and use different types of algorithms as opposed to just one? Second thing is think really hard about where the floor is for that algorithm. Because let's go back to that chart I had where like, if your ability is just, you know, test of ability work if there's massive variation in ability, right? Even where you need that orthogonality. Um, and also think about like the narrowness of the task. So I think what you could, what I, if, if I'm giving advice on this, I would say like the more narrow your task, like if you're Goldman and you think your tasks are really narrow, maybe you're okay on the test. If you think your tests are broad, think really hard about how, how you're screening people in that first screen. So maybe use AI to do a first screen, but don't cut 90%, cut 50%. Then once you get that 50%, maybe try and put them in, you know, use unsupervised learning and try and create clusters of algorithms and then rank within those clusters, right? So I think that, a lot of what I've seen has been supervised based on past performance as opposed to unsupervised based on clusters of skills. And so the advice I tend to give is to say, the paper, again, I never put too much faith in papers, you know, in a, in a single model, even though this is more axiomatic, I, I sort of say, what it suggests is you probably can do ability cuts to cut a bottom percentage, but that percentage might not be as big as you think, right? And using sort of single measures of ability. Once you've done that, I would think much harder about unsupervised learning to create clusters and then within clusters ask, perhaps I can rank. But then I think this is where human ingenuity and this sort of interplay between people and computers becomes really interesting. How do you think about how you construct those clusters? Scott, this is great. I'm gonna apologize for not being attentive to all the questions you've got, uh, you got here. Uh, and a lot of great, and they're great. Uh, maybe we can do something to uh, post uh, this conversation to uh, get some responses to you to some of these uh, some of these issues on it. I wanna make one quick observation. You said that you reviewed all the papers you discussed on that, it was something close to that. Yeah, yeah. What's most remarkable is that these are the published papers. Yeah. As you published all these different papers with different results, says that you are uh, kind of walking the talk on the uh, value of diversity in the public forum. So uh, uh, people should be so lucky to have you as a, as a reviewer is maybe the implication. Uh, but it's, uh, it's all yeah, because they got published, right? So that's, <laughs> that's a good sign. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's okay. great having you uh, and fun seeing your uh, uh, your talk. And the, and you have this. Is this going to be a book? Is it going to be a sixth book for you or, or no? <laughs> no, I think you know we're, we. To, to be honest, like we you know we sent this to management science and they just came back and they and I think it wasn't fully baked. And so it's a pleasure for me to give this. I'm really looking forward to the feedback because we're just. I think, and you'll see when you read the paper, we're, we're still trying to figure out exactly what the right audience is, because it's a, it's a weird mix. So we, I haven't figured out how to quite give voice to this set of questions, but it, yeah, it's possible if there's enough uh, uptake, you know, we could get a second paper done on the clustering thing and then, you know, who knows, Welcome. books are a lot of work. <laughs> Hi, I wanted to thank everyone for um, just the amazing energy that they brought to the seminar. And many people submitted questions in the chat that I didn't get a chance to get to. So I'm going to just take a few minutes to try and answer those. So the first question was, have I thought at all about quantifying the difference between the performance of diverse and non-diverse teams in those situations where there's no test? So if there is no test, that strongly suggests that you want to sort of err in favor of diversity. But I think one of the things we want to think of, if you go back to the Kleinberg paper, there's a degree to which no test exists. So if you're close to having a test existing, then there's probably fewer benefits to diversity. If it's a situation where 
no test is even going to come close to picking the best, best team, then you'd expect the diverse teams to do better. Ultimately, I think of this as an empirical question, and it's really, I think, just a fascinating thing to think about is looking at cases where you know, hiring people according to a single criteria has not worked well, or looking at particular projects or um, problems where you've seen benefits to diversity, to look at how people are making hiring decisions in order to get that diversity, I think is a really exciting area for research. Second question was, how do you manage teams that are diverse in such a way that promotes differences but makes solutions converge? Again, this is a little bit outside my area of expertise, but one of the things we think about a lot in this space in managing diverse teams effectively is recognizing that task conflict can be a good thing. So Catherine Phillips talks about this in her work, that it's, it's really important that you understand that if people are disagreeing about outcomes or what they think is a good solution, and you're really engaging in that in a deep way, that can be a good thing. So sort of you know, embracing and recognizing task conflict. At the same time, though, you've really got to mitigate and reduce any personality conflict. So one of the key things to do there, I think, is to separate people from the ideas they're putting forward, right? and really focus on the ideas and also not feel any personal attachment to the ideas. Also, in terms of getting convergence, again, I think if you if you focus on the you have a common goal, common mission, I think it's easier to get convergence. One of the next questions somebody asked, which I think is just a fascinating one, is a lot of times you're hiring one more person for your team, and how do you think about um, adding someone, the you know the n plus one person or the nth person if you're replacing someone? And here, this is a, a fantastic question because I think this is really where the rubber meets the road. Rather than think about you know, hiring the person that's kind of best overall, like reducing people to a single score, I think what you want to think about is what tools, what skills, what knowledge, what understanding, what experiences does our current team have? And then when you look at the candidates for the job, those that you think could function well in the role, right? So there's got to be a threshold effect. All the mathematical models and all the empirical data that I've ever seen about entrance to graduate school or you know, hiring at firms, there are these sort of threshold effects. There's a general level of competence to do the job. Conditional on that, then you want to ask, is this person bringing something that we don't have before? So maybe no one in your group does random forest and this person's an, ex an expert in random forest. Or maybe nobody in your group has ever worked in a wet lab. Or maybe no one in your group has ever spent, um, you know, everybody's from the suburbs or something, right? So what you want to think about is, is there some experience, knowledge base, training that this person is bringing? the new person's bringing, that's going to add a lot to your group. So one of the things, um, you know, I've talked a lot about my work is instead of thinking in terms of sort of measuring sticks, like how good is a person, you want to think in terms of toolboxes. And so you want to ask, is this person um, bringing tools that we don't have in our group? Next question is people ask, where do we see performance tests being used for entry level or higher level positions? So clearly, I mean, I see much more use of these tests for entry level decisions, right? So, and it's, even for internships, they seem like this has um, definitely become the case. It's kind of ironic, right? Because we've moved away from SAT tests, especially this year because of COVID. But when I talk to my undergraduates about applying for internships, so many of them are saying that they're being given these IQ tests and these cognitive tests. And as I mentioned in the talk, there's places like Goldman that cut half, literally actually over half, 60% of their applicants just due to a test. So it's mostly at the entry level. Now, can they be given to higher level people? So when I was reading an article and writing a paper, Larry Summers, when he went to work um, for, um, in the private sector, was actually given one of these IQ tests in order to get his executive role. So there's some places that they demand that everybody take one of these tests. Now, whether what the bar is for the higher level people, I don't know. Um, someone, next question gets in this, this question of like, you know, how do you, um, when you think in terms of these tools, right, and when you think in terms of like, you know, someone adding different skills, and this kind of relates the second question to the first question, um, how do you harness dissent without getting into person personality conflicts? And again, I mean, this goes back to, you know, William Murray getting to yes sort of stuff. You have to separate the, you know, somebody's interest from the position they're taking and also separate the person from the idea. And so I think that um, it's, again, this is, the theoretical work, the sort of the stuff that like Milan Tambay did in algorithms, the stuff that Kleinberg did, the stuff that and Raghu did, and the stuff that Lou and I did, is kind of like in an ideal sense, if you think of people as sort of bringing different representations, different encodings, like someone who's gray encoding, someone does, you know, some other sort of, you know, standard binary encoding, 
and then you have different heuristics solving a traveling salesperson problem or different you know trees in a random forest you just see this amazing lift or bonus that comes from diversity because there's no arguments there's no personality nobody's identity gets challenged there's no imposter syndrome so i think the challenge is is try to get all the psychological and all the sociological barriers to a free change of ideas out of the way and the simplest way to do that i think is to make people feel a sense of belonging, make people feel as though um, people want them to grow and to have a really strong sense of mission. Um, can you think about this for, you know, applying this to a team of 100 people or how do you form the best teams of 20, like if you've got people in your organization? Absolutely, and I would say like when I go talk to companies or government organizations, one of the things I'll do is I'll say, suppose you're populating a team and you wanna think, okay, I've got 50 people who are my direct reports and I've got to put five people on a team. Your sort of like simple thinking fast approach might be, who are my five smartest people? But again, that's falling prey to this kind of like measuring stick approach. A better thing to do would be to say for each of those 50 reports at some point, you know, have someone on your staff or even have them populate even a spreadsheet like what skills do they have? What projects have they worked on? Are they quantitative? Are they qualitative? Are they an introvert? Are they an extrovert? Um, how long have they been at the firm? What are their interests, right? And then you could sort of say, okay, let me just scrape those rows. I mean, suppose I pick these five people and then look, what's your set of skills, right? So one example here is I was talking to an executive at a company who was, they had a building committee, they're building a new building and he picked what he thought were like the five best people. And then he realized after he and I were talking that those people had only worked in one building. So even though they're diverse in a bunch of other ways, they'd all in their entire work lives had all only worked in one building. And that was kind of a disaster for a building committee, right? Because one of the first things you'd want is have they worked in other, you know, even in other cities, but certainly in other buildings. So I think if you think of people as these vectors of skills, knowledge, those sorts of things, then you can sort of in a strategic way populate a team. Remember one of the models I talked about was kind of this like union of skills, union of knowledge, union of experiences. You can populate a team with a larger union. Um, related to that, someone said, you know, what are these different ways to model problem solving? How do you think about it? Um, I think this is super fun, right? So in the, my book, The Model Thinker, one of the things I say is, it's kind of weird that like the way we write academic papers is you say, here's my model and then I analyze it. Maybe I test it and I draw inferences from it. But if you think of something like problem solving, there's lots of different ways you can model it. And one way that um, I think we can learn a lot is by taking a collection of different models of problem solving. So Lou and I initially had a model of problem solving that consisted of People have representations of a problem and then the heuristics that they use to kind of move along some sort of space. But one construct another model where people maybe have partial representations of the space, right? Or you can imagine solutions in some sort of network and then you get this notion of kind of like the adjacent possible. Um, and I talked about, you know, just like when somebody brings up an idea, I can suddenly think of new things. And so I think that the, the benefit from thinking of different ways of problem solving is if you, if you then think about what process are we using or how big is the group? You get different insights. So for example, if you take the landscape notion of problem solving, one of the things that becomes crucial is being able to tell the height of the point you move to. And so then you're really gonna focus as a group on some way of measuring whether someone's idea is a better idea. So you're always climbing uphill as opposed to going downhill. If you take this sort of like network more creative version of problem solving. Like I have an idea and somebody can build on that, right? You're sort of focusing almost exclusively on the fact that like we can't even, we don't even understand what the landscape is. And so that would suggest maybe starting with a bigger group and not worrying so much about the value of things because you sort of assume, oh, once somebody has the good idea, we'll figure out what it is. Okay, let me bracket those and then move on to the last three questions, which all have a somewhat um, similar feeling. So how do we think about, so one thing is, is how do we think about constructing summary data? So here's the question, how do we think about individual data points as not being misleading when we're sort of comparing apples and oranges, right? So how do we do it, right? I've got this population of potential applicants. I want to score them in some way. How do I do it? Well, I think, I, first of all, great question, right? I think one way is to recognize and try and identify what are the core skills someone needs to have. So at a place like NASA, they will say, okay, if you want this position, you need to have a master's in engineering, you need to have two years management experience. One thing to do is to question how many of those are really needed. So what is, 
What are the core skill sets that someone needs to have coming into this job? Then conditional on that, right? And so I think you can use you know, thermometer type measures for that along those different dimensions. Then conditional on that, I think it actually might make sense to think of using unsupervised learning and look at the candidates you've got and maybe trying to track new candidates and cluster them and say, what types of people are applying to this, right? In terms of you know, their sort of constellations of tools and knowledge and that sort of stuff. And then let's go back to one of the earlier questions. Given your current group of N or N minus one, who should you add? Like what kind of cluster, of, you know, which kind of cluster of skills given competence would be most useful? Because you want to at some point embrace the diversity of your pool. Now, I want to be super careful here though, because like this next question relates to this. They say, like, I totally buy this, but think about flight crews, right? You're mixing these people up. And so you're mixing up, you know, in some sense, one time I've got this co-pilot with this pilot. If I focused on diversity and looked at vectors and sort of said, it's okay if you don't have skills A and B because somebody else will have them, and I start randomly putting crews together, I could end up with a disaster because of the fact that I could have a crew together where neither member of that crew is conscientious. Absolutely, point taken. I think that this, uh, there's a very different calculus here to think about um, if I'm putting small groups of people, like groups of one or two versus groups of seven or eight, the smaller the group, right, the more likely that, it, that something like a, an ability test, a measuring stick test is going to be important or the higher the threshold might be. So you might have a set of constraints that have to be satisfied. If I'm, so let's take a, a company like IDEO. If IDEO has got a project, they're only going to put two people on, three people on. It's a small project. Those people have to be generalists. If they've got a bigger project where they're going to have 15 people on, if you're going to do design thinking for you know, a government infrastructure project, you have, you're throwing 15, 20, 30 people on that. Now the thermometer, the sort of measuring stick calculation matters a lot less, and the sort of clustering matters a lot more because any hole anybody has in their knowledge base, thinking, tool set, that sort of stuff, like I don't know how to do data science, isn't going to matter because somebody else can cover. It's a great question, right? So if I sort of turn this knob as a function of group size, as the group gets bigger, I should embrace diversity more. As the group gets smaller, then these sort of measuring sick tests matter more. Um, the uh, you know, last question you know, I want to address here is just this general thing about how do we think about people who assign sort of single values to people versus algorithms to assign single value to people. And I think that's a really um, fascinating area for future research, right? And Bruce was kind of pushing me on this. I, I think that the, one of the advantages of the algorithm, again, you know, we've talked about a lot and you all know very well, is that like there's no sort of you know, statistical bias in there. There's no, you know, it's going to include all the information. And so the algorithms are going to give you one set of sort of like single dimensional ranking. An individual who interviews a person is going to give a different sort of individual ranking. That alone, that sort of hybrid of person plus algorithm, is going to give you a little bit of the toolbox flavor because you're going to be weighting different aspects of a person differently. I think one of the things you want to think about then is just as just like you like to have, and Google's found strong evidence of this, multiple people interviewing a candidate, you might want to construct multiple artificial intelligence tools, right? Data science tools, some supervised, some unsupervised, to identify candidates and if, you know and rank them and, and just create groups of people that might be interesting to consider. Because the, the core takeaway from what um, you know, I see theoretically and also from you know, all these sort of computational models is that if you look at things something through multiple lenses, through multiple models, you're more likely right, to A, not make a mistake, and B, find something that's really going to be interesting. Or interesting is probably a poor choice of words. Find something that's really going to add a lot of value. Find, identify a person who's going to bring a lot to the mix. So in summary, I want to argue this is re this is a preliminary investigation, it's just a question that just kept coming up. I kept coming into these companies and seeing them apply these performance tests and at the same time saying, we really want diverse employees and realizing there's a contradiction there. And so thinking our way through this contradiction, I think is going to enable organizations, you know, from colleges, governments, for-profits to, to hire better people and to construct better teams. Thank you very, very much for um, all the energy you put into this seminar. I really appreciate it.